Often we need to transmit sensitive data, such as banking information, where every symbol in the message is vital. One mistake can corrupt the entire message. And no matter how we communicate, we face this problem. One kind of corruption occurs when a bit flips. The transmitter sends a 1, but it's received as a 0, or a 0 which is received as a 1. These are called errors. Another kind of corruption is an erasure, which occurs when the bits are so distorted that they're considered unknowns or blanks in the message. For this video, we will discuss this problem in terms of erasures because it simplifies the main ideas. While some communication channels suffer from less corruption than others, it's important to note that corruptions are bound to occur. No channels are truly noiseless. So the problem communication engineers will always face is how can we transmit our messages perfectly when we know some symbols will be lost in transmission? Realize we all face this problem during ordinary voice communication, when a word is misheard in a conversation. To recover from this corruption, we simply repeat ourselves. Technically, this is called a repetition code. It's the simplest error correction code. For example, if we have a binary message, it would be encoded before transmission into two copies of itself. This might be received, for example, with some erasures as follows. These erasures can easily be decoded by comparing the two copies bit by bit. Thus, the message would be decoded correctly. This compare operation is simple and thus can easily keep up with the speed of communication. Unfortunately, simple repetition fails whenever the same bit is erased in both copies. And because this is quite common, this strategy leaves us very vulnerable to failure. Also, it doubles the message length no matter the number of erasures. We express this efficiency issue in terms of code rate, where code rate is the original number of message bits divided by the total number of transmitted bits. Thus, the code rate in this repetition scheme is 50%. That means half of the bits are needed to describe our original message, and the other half are there to protect the message. If we use triple repetition, the code rate would drop to one-third. As the rate drops, the protection increases, but there are fewer message bits sent. So a lower code rate is a more expensive design, since every bit we transmit has some cost. So there is a balance to strike between the code rate and the probability of failure. We need a coding strategy with just enough protection bits to prevent failure for any channel, whether we expect a high or low erasure rate, while also maintaining fast encode and decode operations. To solve this problem, we need to be smarter about how we use the protection bits. First, realize that with repetition codes, each bit is only protecting one bit of information. Instead, we could define a single protection bit that protects the entire message from a single erasure, no matter where it occurs. To do this, we use an encoder which counts the number of ones in the message and then chooses a protection bit value to ensure that the total number of ones in the message is even. Used this way, we call this protection bit a parity bit. The sender includes this parity bit at the end of the message. Now consider what happens when a single erasure occurs during transmission. The receiving decoder can correct this erasure with a simple operation. It counts the number of ones in the received message, and so it knows the erased bit must have been a 1. Notice that a single parity check bit yields quite an improvement to the code rate compared to repetition coding. However, the chance of failure has increased compared to repetition. With a single parity check bit, we can only correct a single erasure. And if two or more erasures occur, the code fails because there isn't enough information to reconstruct the bits. To decrease the chances of failure, we can divide up the message into distinct sets and include multiple parity check bits, where now each parity check bit protects a different set of bits from a single erasure. We call each of these sets a parity check set. And as we add more parity check bits, we increase the number of erasures we can potentially correct at the cost of gradually decreasing the code rate. In general, the number of parity check bits should be at least equal to the number of erasures if we want to have a chance of correcting them all. However, we face the same problem with this approach. The code fails if two or more erasures occur in any parity check set. 
In that case, the bits can't be recovered. In 1950, Richard Hamming was looking at simple ways of correcting multiple errors when transmitting a sequence of bits. His trick was to use overlapping parity check sets, which made it possible to correct any two erasures. As a simple example, consider a 4-bit message and three parity check bits. Each parity check bit covers three message bits. Now, no matter where two erasures occur, the code will always be able to correct. In this case, we can't recover the first erasure right away, since both black and blue sets contain two erasures. However, the second erasure can be recovered first, because the red set has one erasure. And this provides the information we need to recover the first bit. This cascade effect where one correction allows us to solve another is a very important insight, because instead of correcting all erasures in one step, we can remove erasures in multiple passes or iterations. It's important to note that this kind of cascade effect only works if we have at least one set with only one erasure at each step, otherwise it would fail. This led to a decade of excellent research by many people who built on this idea of overlapping parity check sets. Much of this work was aimed at finding the right structure for the parity check set arrangement. But when we extended this overlapping approach to very long messages with many thousands of bits, we ran into a problem. This was because with longer messages, most assumed that we could use larger overlapping subsets. But having many large overlapping subsets turns the process of decoding the parity check bits from a simple operation into a complex puzzle. This is because when the subsets are very large, the chance of getting a subset in which there is only one erasure is very small, and this prevents that cascade effect from starting or continuing. Instead, the parity check bits must be solved using a more complex decoding operation, because now you are faced with solving a system of equations, which becomes more and more complex as the number of equations grows. But these more complex decoding operations slow down the communication process to the point where it's no longer practical to use. What we need is a code with very fast decode operations. So we are left with a final problem. How can we extend this overlapping subset approach to work quickly over very long messages in a way that can handle any erasure rate we encounter while maintaining a good code rate? In 1960, a doctoral thesis by Robert Gallagher discovered a new approach to the communication coding problem which is in wide use today, particularly in cellular networks and data storage applications. Gallagher combined two key insights. The first was to use smaller parity check sets instead of larger ones. This improves the chances that many parity check sets will contain only a single erasure and enables the cascade effect to happen. This was key to keeping the decoding speed fast over long messages. Because it's faster for a computer to solve many simple problems instead of a single complex problem, which solves all of them at once. Gallagher realized that we need an amount of overlap that is large enough to protect each bit well, but not so large that the correction problem becomes very complex. He measures the amount of overlap by something he calls the density, that is how densely the message bits are connected to the parity check bits. With larger subsets we have a high density, that is each message bit is connected to many parity check bits. With smaller subsets we have a lower density, that is each message bit is connected to fewer parity check bits. And this is where the name low density parity check codes comes from. But aside from the size of the sets, there is also the problem of how to structure the connection between parity and message bits. And that leads to his second insight, which was inspired by the work of Peter Elias, who had recently shown that looking for the right structure for large subsets was relatively unimportant. Instead, he used a random subset arrangement. This simplified the problem compared to trying to design an ideal structure for the subsets, and remarkably, it did very well. And that's the key idea behind low density parity check codes. Use small, overlapping, randomly assigned parity check sets. This allows us to solve erasures in a rapid cascade of simple operations, no matter how long the message is, or what the erasure rate is, 
while maintaining a fast decoding speed. But there is one last insight to understand when it came to the actual construction of these codes. Recall that Hamming's construction focused on protecting each message bit with multiple parity check bits in order to better protect those bits in case of multiple erasures. The problem is this doesn't provide the same protection to the parity bits, which can also be lost during transmission. Notice that each parity check bit is itself only connected to one parity check set. Since any bit that is connected to only one parity check set is vulnerable, this leaves all parity check bits vulnerable. This can make correction impossible in some cases. For example, this would happen when one message bit is erased and two parity bits it's connected to are also erased. In this case, we are stuck because the cascade can't happen. And over very long messages, with many small parity check sets, this kind of failure would become more and more likely to happen. The solution to this dilemma is to instead view things in a more general way and protect the parity bits and the message bits equally. That is, we make sure all bits, message and parity, are contained in multiple check sets. And now we have everything we need to understand the basics of low density parity check codes, or LDPC codes. To see this in action, let's do a very simple example. Now let's say our message is 101. Recall that we chose our subsets randomly to generate the code. Encoding is now done by finding a collection of parity check bits so that all the check sets have an even number of ones. This involves solving a simple set of linear equations. Now imagine our message is received with three erasures as follows. To decode this message, we begin with the check sets that have a single erasure first, such as this one. And we repeat this process for every check bit until there are no more erasures left. That's one way the iterative process can work using low density parity check codes. It's simple, fast, reliable, and can be extended to messages of any length. Today, many communication devices use LDPC codes, and versions of LDPC codes are being proposed for fifth generation wireless systems, known as 5G. But it's important to note that when these codes came out, they did not have a big impact at first and were almost forgotten for many years. I invented LDPC about 60 years ago. There were no, no cell phones then. Data transmission was painfully slow, expensive, and error prone. MIT's main computer had a computational power halfway between a modern cell phone and a coffee machine. Error correction coding was a fascinating theoretical problem then, studied by many mathematicians and engineers. Simple schemes were ineffective but complex schemes were too expensive for 1960 technology. LDPC was an interesting midpoint, cute and interesting to theoreticians, but 35 years before technological feasibility. That's the way research is and the way it should be. Hard research problems take years to solve and should not be overly dependent on details of current technological capabilities. Technological capabilities and research projects both proceed at their own pace, and applications result when both are ready. Thank you.